I am thrilled to present an artist who needs no introduction. He is one of the world's most important and influential figures in modern art, Mr. Frank Stella. It is our honor to host this exhibition and this great artist. Please help me welcome Frank Stella to the stage. Thank you, everyone. Good, the microphone is on. I want to start very briefly by stating the obvious, which you all know, that uh, Mr. Stella is one of the most profound and provocative artists of his time, our time. He's an astonishingly eloquent writer, and he's also a very thoughtful and articulate speaker, which we will find out tonight. I wanted to begin and jump right in by asking uh, you to indulge us with a question about a formative experience. A lot of artists, my wife is one of them, are, have formative experiences as younger, often children, um, that seem to prevision or envision something about their future path in life and art. And I wondered if you might recount for us something I came across recently I had not seen before, in which you described an experience in elementary school when your teacher asked for a volunteer to draw a house. Can you uh, sort of recount that story for us and what it meant to you at the time or later? I think it was a little more complicated than a house, mm -hmm. but it was a scene. And I don't know why I, you know, there are a lot of kids who always put up their hand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and then the, the advantage of it was that you went to the back of the class and had your own table mm -hmm. and a piece of paper and pencils and then you were working on whatever it was the teacher asked you to work while the other students had to do what, they, what the normal course of events uh, dictated. And, uh, but it was, a, it was a, I guess it was a house, but it was a house in a landscape. Mm -hmm. And I find it kind of difficult, although I don't know why I was so confident about uh, working on it. But I liked the idea or the challenge, I guess. And what did you use to make the house? Was it a ruler and you used geometry? Uh, I, I don't, that, that part I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> All I know is that it did it. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to read something you said about it was, um, uh, I realized I was left with a problem and knew I had to do something about it with the result that I made something and I made it my own way. I just used the material. I used the ruler and the pencil and I made a box and triangles and pieced it together and laid out what turned out to be an incredibly rigid geometric scheme of a house and the situation, which I guess would be the landscape. So, yeah, so. I, I wouldn't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to believe everything you tell us. <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to start actually, interestingly, also with something I had not realized before this exhibition. Uh, Richard Devencorn, obviously, is a very famous artist from California, uh, much respected and beloved here in the Bay Area. And I noted that on one of your working drawings for paintings done early in New York City after you moved here in 1958, um, including works like Colorado on the screen, that you had written on the drawing Richard Devencorn's line. And you also met, told an interviewer that paintings like this, uh, quote, wouldn't have happened without Diebenkorn. And I was wondering if you could describe what you saw in his work in the late 1950s, if indeed you saw it in person. Uh, you know, actually, that's a good uh, point. Or something. I, I certainly saw them in reproduction. I don't know if I really saw any of the actual paintings. But they were, uh, to me anyway, very open, very accessible. And uh, uh, land, uh, the landscape quality and I guess the notion uh, of somewhere else, uh, other than New York, where California was a, a very uh, kind of uh, dramatic, uh, kind of romantic kind of idea. But I, I, I liked the way uh, I had some sense, uh, a pretty straightforward sense of, uh, there was something I recognized or felt comfortable with about the way he put painting down on the, on the canvas. Mm -hmm. It was pretty much as simple as that. And uh, Colorado, that particular painting, is probably related to Diebenkorn. Uh, it, it, I mean, obviously as a painting, but I mean, as, as part of my life uh, at that time. And I was uh, traveling. And uh, it was at a time when I wasn't sure exactly what I was going to do. And I was flirting with the idea of leaving school and uh, uh, going to uh, a school in, uh, in California because I, some, somebody told me that uh, Stephen Korn was teaching at UCLA or something like that. And I think that uh, I had this idea. 
And when I, um, after I left school anyway, uh, this painting, Colorado, Colorado was as far as I got on my uh, trip across <laughs> the country. And then I turned back. But anyway, uh, that, that, I think that was the kind of relationship that it had to uh, Devon Coyne. Yeah. And speaking of the painting Colorado, you told an interviewer, quote, I'd be happy to still be painting landscapes. I think what really happened, I had some idea of the landscape outside New York City, but I was doomed. There wasn't any possibility except the urban landscape, which is a pretty straightforward way of looking at the black paintings. How did the environment of New York City shape your early works, these works like East Broadway and Great Jones Street, but also the black paintings? Well, I think that pretty much self-explanatory. Yeah. Uh, um, East Broadway, I mean, uh, you know, yellow and black could be the colors of New York, the asphalt and the taxi cabs. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you come there, and, and it's, it's the way it feels, the, the movement and the way things are. And... Uh, um, the geometry did seem to be, I think it is a kind of urban geometry. And a kind urban of urban landscape. landscape or, excuse me, yeah. 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 Okay. And it's a fairly loose geometry. Hmm. I mean, a painterly geometry, and it does, uh, eventually it changes, it becomes a little uh, more <clears throat> rigid. You also mentioned that the bands and the blocks in these paintings had some kind of landscape relationship or atmospheric space in them, and I wanted to get away from that as much as I could. Can you talk about how artists such as Motherwell and Roscoe here on the screen around the same time period were wrestling with figure and ground issues and more importantly, how you were wrestling with them? Well, I think they wrestled more than I did, but I mean, <laughs> I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't worried about it that much. Yeah. And I'm not so sure they were that worried about it either. Hmm. But um, uh, I knew Motherwell's painting. I, I guess that's, is that a uh, little Spanish exactly. prison? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but uh, I don't recognize from the it's monitor one of the here. Murals for yeah, I was I was going to yeah. say, but the color on the monitor is surprising. Yeah. <laughs> it looks sort of like a Donald Judd. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> um, but I lost the mother. You knew the mother yeah. well. From yeah. Reproduction and or yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I think that's at the modern yeah. picture, um, and we we I'd seen it, and it w and it was just kind of obvious in a way about the. Um, the bands being pretty much bands all by themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess, you know, the way it looks on the screen here. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, uh, um, you know, if you turned it sideways y y and made the red rectangle a little bigger, you'd have the same painting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when four of your black paintings were shown at the Museum of Modern Art in 16 Americans in 1959, you pointed out that there was another artist in the exhibition working in black, Louise Nevelson. And I know you also admire greatly, as do I, Ed Reinhardt's work. And if I recall correctly, actually purchased one on time at a very early point in your career, which must have been a, quite a big commitment to make at that point. And I wondered if you could talk about their use of black, whether it had become a sort of, uh, you know, archetypal, so to speak, uh, abex color already, and how you, what you saw in their works and how they differed from yours. Uh, black, I mean, it's there. And uh, uh, when I was making the earlier paintings, landscape, urban landscape, whatever you want to call them, I mean, there was, uh, a, you know, it was often black and another color. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure how that happened. Uh, but it did, and it was, uh, I, I was working that way. And then uh, the, the paintings that's in the show here, uh, Delta, that, that, that was a a black and uh, red painting, mm -hmm. and I painted out the red because the, the painting wasn't going very well. And then that, that, you know, triggered the idea that it wasn't, maybe you could do it with just all, basically all black, and you didn't, you could have a ground and not another color. Hmm. So that went from, I don't know, in a funny way, being a, not a black painting, but a two-color painting, mm -hmm. a ground and a black, and, uh, instead of a three-color painting. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, black, my idea about the black paintings and about, say, Ad and uh, uh, Louise Nevelson, uh, there was, it was there and I certainly knew a lot about it, but the idea that I had, and I, don't, I think I'd only seen a reproduction, but I, I, I knew about um, Rauschenberg's black painting. Mm -hmm. And uh, when um, a friend of mine, uh, Emile D'Antonio, brought Ellen Award from the Stable Gallery uh, to see the black paintings in, the, in my studio in, on West Broadway. They were naturally both drunk, 
but, uh, <laughs> El <laughs> but Eleanor Ward said, ah. Uh. <laughs> she didn't say anything. I just moved all the paintings around. Then she went down the stairs, and Dee called me later and said, yeah. She said, but you know, Bob, I, I already had that. Bob did those black paintings for me anyway. <laughs> so that was it with the stable gallery. But that was a beautiful gallery, actually. Yeah. The, you had it a was really a stable. Oh, yeah. You had a wonderful quote about Ed Reinhardt. You said, if you don't know what the, his paintings are about, you don't know what painting is about. Um, is, uh, How come I never heard of any of these quotes? <laughs> 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 it was in an interview with Sidney Tillum. <laughs> oh, Sidney, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's probably why. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll leave it at that. You own one, though. <laughs> no, but that was a little bit sad, owning that painting, because um, I got it from Betty Parsons, and it was the only painting that I had in the house, or we had in the house, in which it, w it was a problem because the, the kids wouldn't, they knew about paintings, they wouldn't, they would left them alone and they, it wasn't a problem. But when we had kids there, uh, the black paintings were hanging on a white wall mm -hmm. and naturally I hung it pretty low. And they, they would, uh, they thought it was an opening or a door. So when they <laughs> came up to it, they would put their hand up to keep from falling through. Uh, the space, and that didn't work out so well, so I had to give, <laughs> the, <laughs> had to get the, give the painting back. Okay. I know but that... It's a, you know, it, it's a, but it's one of the more interesting things about perception. Yeah. Well, and you spoke about how important it was to see them in his space because the light was perfect at the, I believe, at the end of the day to see the subtle... Yeah, he had a beautiful uh, studio on um, Broadway yeah. and rest of the... Oh, okay. I know uh, many people talk about uh, Jasper John's flag painting, but I wanted to ask you about his target with four faces, which I believe you also saw, and what that painting might have offered by way of insight. Uh, the, Jasper was such a given, and the paintings, uh, it, you're right. I mean, I, maybe the flags didn't, I don't know, I didn't think that much about the flags, but sort of every, I think I'm not the only one. I think everybody thought about the target. Uh, even now the <laughs> world of Target. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> uh, and it was, but to me it was about the, uh, basically about the uh, repetition and the, but basically also uh, the other, other reason would be that the image itself is so direct and obviously you have to look at it. Mm -hmm. And symmetrical. Uh, like the flag, yeah, I guess. It's, yeah, it's pretty symmetrical. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and not, not to leave it out, but of course, uh, John's flag was in a show at Leo Castelli in 1958. And um, you talked about the stripes and the rhythm and repetition of the stripes. And certainly, I would imagine the uh, synchronicity of a two-dimensional image object, the flag, uh, as one critic said, is it a painting of a flag or is it a flag? And of course, the answer is yes, on some level. Um, and I'm also curious about it in a slightly different way, uh, other than how it might have been formally interesting. Did, at the time, did you see it as, a, as it was discussed by critics as a neo-data appropriation of a found object, or did you also see it as a culturally loaded symbol in the middle of the Cold War? I'm just curious what your take on it was at the time. You know, I mean, I just took it as a painting. I was really quite interested in how, uh, you know, the thing about Jasper and, and his paintings is people get very excited about them and everything, but uh, mm -hmm. a lot of the people who were painting and were interested in it get kind of excited about the way he actually painted mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. uh, which you don't hear much about. Yeah, and beautiful and caustic. Oh, uh, yeah. Luminous. Okay. I also wanted to ask, um, the titles of three of your black paintings, including the one on the screen, Die Fanny Hoch, uh, Reichstag, Arbeit macht frei, all made references to the history of Nazi Germany. And I know you said that later a viewer confronted you some years later and said, how do I know which side you're on? And you said she was right to ask the question. Can you explain what you meant by that? Well, it's kind of obvious. I mean, yeah. one of the advantages, I suppose, of being young and involved, and uh, uh, I didn't think very much about it. But I mean, uh, you know, it wasn't, you know, there's a certain level at which you, you do sort of what you want to do and theoretically you say to yourself, that's what I feel. Uh, but you know, in the end it gets bigger than that. You know, you're not, you don't have such a carte blanche. Mm. Uh, you know, it, 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 I don't know, it, it, it's tricky. Yeah. Well, you drew an analogy between 
the often controlling and coercive nature of fascism as a movement, but also fascist architecture, and the potential for controlling or coercive aspects of the best art and architecture. Could you talk about that a little bit? Is that connection there sometimes? Well, that was Bill Rubin's idea. I can blame him. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I think that, the, um, that there's a certain appeal uh, not to the fascist part of it, but I mean, to the, I mean, you could say, you know, that it's a, a, a way of, of seeing things and organizing them uh, that has, that, that, that exerts control and is rational in a way that's easily understood. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the uh, rationalism that's obvious, uh, that sometimes uh, is oppressive. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, sometimes maybe it can be liberating if you can find a way to make it work. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm showing, of course, one of the aluminum series works, Avacena, and I know that these very astonishing and very beautiful, I have to say, that it's really wonderful to be in front of these works. Uh, paintings, of course, by cutting away the notches and cutting the opening in the middle of this work, uh, really, I've been using the analogy of almost throwing a brick through the window of the traditional Renaissance notion of the, win the painting is a window onto another realm or another world. And they certainly on some level asserted their object quality and their objectness. And this became the point of much discussion, probably too much, in the art world. Um, but I wanted to ask you if you could speak about the understanding and misunderstanding of these aluminum series works and your intentions for them um, and how they may or may not have been misinterpreted in relation to minimalism and art in general. Well, you already said it, but no, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> but there's a... Um, the, I think that there's a couple of things. Uh, the, the first is obvious that it's a, it's a beginning and an idea about shaping. But the point about making it that, that it ended up, it ends up as a shape canvas. But mm -hmm. the, it would be, well, what's the reason? Why did that happen? Mm -hmm. And that happened because uh, trying to work with the bands and uh, uh, trying to get something uh, about um, a kind of geometric or symmetrical organization that was, uh, you know, became static in a way. So you're thinking mm -hmm. about something, well, how do the bands move in a way? Mm -hmm. And with a jog or something, it changes uh, the way the space works on the surface. And, uh, and I think that's what the, and then it ended up that in order to make the jog work, it, it, it helped or it needed to be shaped, you needed to take the leftover part mm -hmm. away. Okay. I wanted to uh, use a, I hope it's not a pseudo quote, <laughs> but I think it's very beautifully put about this issue and this controversy. I used to say that after all, a painting is only an object, not meaning it's just any object. It's a special kind of object, one that is intended to be a painting. My position was a reaction to the high-flown rhetoric of the 50s, but my reasoning got abbreviated, and I thought that was very well, well put. I hope it's your quote. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I guess it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, with the Copper series, very famously, um, the shaping of the canvases became even more radical to the point where it seemed to not only posit the proposition, how much could you take away of a painting and still have it be a painting, but possibly as well, are you now opening up the environment, the surrounding environment, to some kind of engagement with the work of art or possibly incorporation into the work of art? Um, and I wanted to ask you, um, Saul Lewitt actually said the next logical step would have been to actually make paintings on the wall, and he was very grateful to you for leaving that to him. Um, but I'm wondering if you ever thought about actually painting on the wall, or is painting of such primacy to you, both personally and historically, that you really wanted to make your moves in that direction and on, in that medium? Well, you know, in the beginning, I, you know, and I worked with my father, and then when I first came to the city, I worked painting walls, so I wasn't mm. too thrilled to be, go back <laughs> to being a house painter. But, and, but on, on another level, uh, I really think that um, I wanted the, the surface that I was painting on to, to be itself. And so I think that uh, y you can see it a little bit in the, uh, mm. in the copper painting there. I mean, it, it's no big deal, but the fact that the stretchers mm. uh, were a little bit deeper, three mm. or four inches, in order to separate them a tiny bit from the wall, 
and uh, make the surface, the painted surface, the surface of the painting, you know, really obvious. I think uh, that's what was important to me. Did you consider making sculpture at this time at all? Or? Um, no, I didn't, I, I didn't think about it then. Okay. Although uh, a couple of years later, we um, made a, a design for um, Bob and Ethel's skull, and it was going to be uh, on the ceiling hmm. and in plaster. Hmm. And then Ethel said, but you can't take it with you. So that <laughs> commission didn't work out. <laughs> I wanted to ask one last question about the Copper series. I'm showing, the obviously, six of the small Benjamin Moore paintings, um, which, as you famously said, you wanted to keep as good as it is in the can, right, essentially off the paint chips, um, primary, secondary colors, and so forth. And I was always taken by, with the Copper paintings, so many of them resemble letters, L's upside down or backwards, T is there on the left, T is actually for the painting Telluride. It sounds like a children's primer in a way. Um, there's an H and so forth. And I was struck by the fact that their resemblance to letters of the alphabet, even if inverted or reversed, um, that it's almost a new language. And similarly, with the uh, Benjamin Moore paintings, getting back to basics, I think you once described them as the colors of a box of crayons, the most basic primaries and secondaries. Is there a way in which you were either teaching yourself and, or teaching the public about the fundamentals of perception and art and painting and color and really basic way that was really powerful for that reason? And well, I don't think I wanted to teach anybody about anything except I wanted to teach myself. But I think that the basic idea with using things that are, are relatively simple uh, or prime, uh, you know, uh, kind of basic is, um, is an idea of, uh, and I think that's what underlies basically the geometry mm -hmm. of all of the stripe paintings, mm -hmm. is it's uh, about building a structure uh, that that can be a painting or works as a painting, and then it's a structure that you can build on later on. So it's a way of building uh, your confidence or a, a, a way of making uh, uh, your kind of world or your kind of way of making painting that, that you feel comfortable with and also you feel has, a, uh, has the, uh, the strength of a, a, a structure that gives you something to build on later mm. on. Uh, you mentioned that Joseph Albers was one of the first abstract artists you studied closely, even, I, I believe, in, at Andover, yeah, yeah, perhaps, yes, and yeah. along with Mondrian. You said, I believe, it, you actually, in a way, knew works of the 20s, 30s, and 40s almost better than your contemporaries until you moved to New York City, but when you were at Andover yeah, was, and the yeah, sort of historical true. greats, Malevich, Mondrian, and so forth. Um, and I'm curious about Albers' ideas about color, most famously, but what's often overlooked also his ideas about space and movement in the homage to the square series and how that might you know, uh, be synchronous or differ from your own ideas about color, space, and movement in the concentric square series. Well, I, actually, I think in some terrible way we're exactly the same. Uh, I don't <laughs> think... Uh, my, my way of dealing with it in the concentric square uh, paintings was you know, truly mechanical. I mean, it's red, you know, various combinations of the uh, of the colors in various, uh, um, but it's really paint by the numbers. Um, Albers is a little more subtle, but I mean, the truth was that um, I never, um, I never could get Albers. I mean, mm. <laughs> uh, and we we grew up with Albers and Hoffman, mm. so uh, it's a funny world uh, to be interested in painting and be interested in something in which you have two Germans, on e one on either side, mm. and uh, one fairly rigid and the other very loose. And uh, I think that that's what happened to me in the end. Um, with the Irregular Polygon series, you spoke of trying to achieve something akin to a rubber stamp or a cookie cutter effect where everything would be direct right to the eye, uh, that you didn't have to look around, you got the whole thing right away. And you've spoken of both Matisse and Malevich as being significant influences for the series, uh, particularly the Red Studio and, and his Suprematist composition, which are here on the screen. And I'm wondering if you could talk about how these seemingly very different artists uh, might have intersected in some way in your own thinking. Well, a lot of it's in the detail. I mean, uh, in the sense that uh, you're working on something, you have something you like or something that gives you a problem or something, and you think about what, you know, 
what'll, what'll make it work a little easier for me, or what is it that I've seen that I liked and that, I, that, I, that still stays with me. Mm. And of course, the, um, as far as the geometry of the new pieces I was working on, the uh, irregular, uh, irregular polygons, uh, certainly the Malevich is kind of obvious. Mm. Uh, but, um, and the Matisse, I would say, I guess is not so obvious, except it, it worked in this series the same way it worked in the black paintings. What was, mm. what was uh, um, compelling about the um, Matisse was the, uh, the negative quality of the drawing, mm. the whiteness of the canvas showing through. And so I almost, um, wasn't until quite a bit later, even in this painting, that I would uh, let anything touch each other. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that. <laughs> Didn't you I don't want to go into that. Masking part. tape that bled, so you'd keep that yeah. negative space instead of drawing a line. You'd let the space. Ah, uh, yeah, I do the line in pencil and then taped oh, over okay. it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, um, while you were at Princeton, you wrote a thesis on kingship in Celtic, Carolingian, and Ottonian manuscript illumination. And as a small portion of that, which perhaps has gotten way too much attention, um, but nonetheless, um, you discussed conceptions of ornament, decoration, in both medieval manuscripts and, uh, this is the Book of Kells, of course, and in the work of Jackson Pollock, and I'm wondering if you could just talk about how you saw the issues of decoration and abstraction in these seemingly, again, very disparate works 800 years apart. Uh, I don't know. I, it was... Um you know, you have to write these papers. So <laughs> <laughs> and I like uh, ma illuminated manuscripts, and I was interested in them, but I didn't read German. So you needed to apply a little imagination to flesh out your paper. <laughs> um, but the fact of the matter was that um, I, you're actually, you show the Pollock, and then, uh, and then you show the... Uh, Haran. Uh, the, yeah, the... Um, protractor painting, uh, and it is it, it is decorative. But you know, there was something about the uh, a manuscript illumination, uh, and it, it's like it, it, you can relate it to Pollock in, in a lot of ways. But there was something special about itself uh, that uh, made a, a, a really uh, a, a strong or deep impression, if you want to call it. And that was the fact that it um, it worked as art. And, uh, and it, it just, it, 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 it set a, a level or a, a kind of intensity that I, I, I couldn't forget. And so you try to get some of that or hope or one way that it comes across your path uh, that you can make it, uh, you can make things that work in that kind of way. Hmm. So it was a, a kind of an example. Hmm. Hmm. I also wanted to ask about uh, your first visit to the Barnes Foundation, which I believe was 1969, right? Hmm in the midst of the protractor works. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually around the time that I went. Um, by the way, I had the same reaction you did, which is why I didn't understand why all these Renoirs were there with the great artists like Cezanne and Matisse. Um, <laughs> I felt Renoir he didn't night. belong at the ripe age of uh, about 12 or so. But anyway, um, so I know you saw, of course, among many things, uh, Matisse's Joy of Life, uh, which I, you described essentially as a sort of consummate painting, um, and the dance, which you see here on the screen. And you said around this time, my main interest is to make what is popularly called decorative painting truly viable in unequivocal abstract terms. Decorative, that is, in a good sense, in the sense that it's applied to Matisse. And again, seemingly, there's a disparate... And I should mention, of course, Damascus Gate, the painting on the screen, um, has a title that speaks of architecture. Um, my own impression of it is even as well that these kind of bands of color often described as either protractors or, or ribbon-like or rainbow-like remind me, uh, some of them, of flying buttresses or other architectural forms of support and vaulted arches, barrel vaults, and so forth. So the title suggests an architectural connection. And one of the fabulous things about the Matisse mural, the dance at the Barnes, is how beautifully it's integrated into architecture. So I'm wondering if you could talk about Matisse's figurative work and its relation uh, to your own abstract language. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the basic problem, I guess. I, mean, I don't want to get into the word problem all the time. But it is figurative, OK? And it's very abstract. And it, but it, it is, again, what it is. But that's always, it, it's always going to be there. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't have 
abstraction can't find its own level. Mm -hmm. And the issue is really, can abstraction find uh, the same kind of level that Matisse was able, and Picasso and Moreau were able to reach? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I think it's possible, and you can try. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean that it's better. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that there won't be uh, figurative or some other kind of expression mm -hmm. uh, that, 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 that can be available to painting. Mm -hmm. In 1970, at the time of the New York Museum of Modern Art retrospective, um, I know you were given a book by Richard Meyer, the architect, on Polish uh, wooden synagogues. You see actually the cover on the screen, but more importantly, I'm showing one of the plates from the book. It was published in 1959. And um, this is a point in your career of which you said, uh, the crisis of abstraction followed from its having become mired in the sense of its own materiality, the sense that the materials of painting could and should dictate its nature. That's not enough, and the belief that it was was killing painting. Um, so around this time, you begin the Polish Village series, and um, can you talk about how the architectural renderings in this book dovetailed with your own growing interest in Malevich and Russian constructivism? Uh, well, I, you know, I don't want to keep repeating myself, saying how obvious it is, but, um, <laughs> but, but um, I would say that... Uh, it, it, it's really pretty straightforward in the sense that uh, I wanted uh, to do something that I hadn't been able to do before, and, and it became kind of obvious in thinking about Malevich and Russian constructivism, mm -hmm. and you know, and uh, and uh, and the architecture of the time. And that was, uh, it seemed to me that there was some sense in. You know, you always stretched your canvas. I shaped it. I was making it. And I thought, well, uh, basically, it seemed to me that I was willing to take, a, well, sort of a chance to, uh, to build a painting. So I was going to build a painting, and that, that was it. it. It would be done when it was built. But then I could, quote, unquote, decorate it or paint it, and it would become a painting. And uh, that would be uh, a way of working and a way of thinking about uh, building paintings. And uh, uh, I think that that was really a, as straightforward a, as it could be, but it had a uh, it had certain a little bit of an el element of risk because the way it was organized, I couldn't help it. I don't know why the, because because you had to build it in a way it, it was a, you sort of drifted away from the basic drive of abstraction in the 60s and everything, uh, say, color field planing, uh, basically uh, simplifying things and uh, making them, uh, making your geometry or your imagery very simple. And this was uh, kind of conventional, uh, uh, relatively complicated uh, geometry. And it, it was looking, it was tough to make something that you knew was looking backwards. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if, um, unlike, say, Damascus Gate or some of the protractors, which seem entirely built, organized, geometricized, um, fanned out, you know, using a protractor, using tools and so forth, compasses, if on some level the sort of um, disorganization of the Polish village series uh, speaks in any way to the destruction of that culture in the sense that they seem to be as much collapsing as being constructed, and as much being destructed as constructed, I guess is the way of putting it. I, I don't, I, I guess I don't see it that way because the part that I was interested in um, outside of the overall thought of it was that um, the, the drawings and, uh, and the quality of the construction of the wooden uh, 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 that showed in the drawings was, uh, there was a lot of, it's a dopey word, but uh, they were like the things, the things interlocked. Mm. There was a lot of uh, uh, a lot of carpentry and kind of fitting mm. uh, that uh, made me think about uh, making the geometry. So some often the goal of geometry is to be uh, is to reach a kind of simplified mm. uh, version of itself, and this was to uh, let it be as uh, complicated as possible. Mm. Okay. And I know you mentioned that uh, um, you said it was not just about the synagogues, but the destruction of them and that culture in you know, well, Jewish it was, culture. Uh, uh, yes, well, I mean, it was obvious in yeah. a certain sense. But, I mean, there was something about uh, uh, constructivism and about uh, the growth of modernism. I mean, it, it traced the, the destruction, unfortunately, the synagogues uh, traced the, uh, the same 
the growth of abstraction early mm. in the beginning of the century from uh, mm. Berlin to Warsaw to Moscow and back. Mm. And the suppression of the Russians, probably in particular, uh, yeah. in Germany, the Bauhaus, yeah, okay. Um, we're showing, of course, uh, two of the works from the Exotic Bird series. Um, I believe your first set of uh, curves, uh, architectural engineering curves, was purchased in California, I think. Where did you buy a set of uh, ship curves here? Yeah, okay. I did, in, in Los Angeles. Oh, yeah. okay, yeah, when you were I, printing I, at, uh, I can't remember the store, but anyway, yeah. Okay. I don't know, it okay. was because it was so complete. It was a very, yeah, the, these are nice complete thing. sets of antique, right? Antique uh, sets. Yeah, I don't know, this might not have been antique, but okay. I don't know, but it was. Um, many of you in the audience will recognize in uh, Eskimo Curly at the lower right, the, the top, if I have it correctly, is a ship curve, beneath it is an S-curve, French curve, and then below that is a railroad curve, which bends very subtly because, of course, a railroad train can't turn on a dime. Um, and I'm curious about the found object aspect of these in a way they seem to have provided you with presets that you didn't have to invent, and I wonder if that was useful for you. Yeah, I think that is probably true, but I think that the thing, the most appealing thing about it was that, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, is that they, that the shape exists and you can trace it. So mm. you can, uh, it's easy to manipulate the shapes. And uh, um, normally, I mean, you could have, a, a, you could cut out your own cardboard triangles and then trace around them and move them around on the page. But there's something about something that's given like that that, uh, mm. uh, Seems you know it's 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 almost hate to use this word fun to work with it. <laughs> God forbid. <laughs> um, there's a very interesting shift from the Polish village works, which by definition are architectural and therefore inorganic, to the exotic birds, which, as the title suggests, um, are somewhat inspired by bird uh, forms and themes and so forth. Um, and I know you said that. For me, painting these metal reliefs is a way of infusing the piece with life. The brush strokes, the flow of paint might be compared to the circulatory process in the body. Um, and this is fascinating to me if there's this perhaps idea that somehow the Polish village constructed works where the, the bones are the foundations of constructivism in a real sense. And then in a sense, the exotic birds are somehow adding this more vital sense of life and flesh and movement and color and so forth, something more organic. I think it was intended to be more organic. I'm not sure. Uh, the, the organic, it's a problem with becoming more organic uh, because what happens is, what actually happened is it became more painterly. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, the issue or what, what they ended up being about. It was about uh, a way of uh, changing the way of painting, which was again a, a kind of uh, going backwards. Mm -hmm. How did uh, Picasso's concept of making things real that you talked about influence the creation of the exotic birds, having a real physical presence that you talk about with his painting and his sculpture, but especially the paintings? Well, what actually, uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what happens, but um, with these paintings, uh, the exotic birds came after the Polish village uh, pieces. But the Polish village pieces uh, were in three parts. And they, were, they were done as a drawing, so they were, there was a flat version of them, and then a, a low-relief version, and then a, 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 a deep-relief version. Which, and it was really a pretty straightforward version of uh, plain geometry moving to solid geometry. Hmm. And I think that... Um, the Picasso's kind of interesting here. Actually, I hadn't thought about it, but uh, what happens in the uh, exotic birds is that uh, um, they're, they're actually beginning to be layered. And the layers are something like the basic way in which the planes are layered in the Cubist painting. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, they would eventually... Uh, uh, it's, a, it's an idea of having uh, something like uh, the landscape and the object be, become physical, and in uh, in a way that uh, in cubism it uh, it seems that uh, only the object could be physical, or the uh, or the uh, uh, landscape and everything could be uh, illusionistic or painterly. Hmm. Um, we're looking, of course, at one of the circuit series, Talladega, at the lower right, uh, series of works based on racetracks, both Formula One and in this case. 
Talladega, the stock car racetrack. And um, there's a wonderful quote, which is well known about these works um, and others like them, uh, constructions, these metal, aluminum, hollow core relief constructions. I work away from the flat surface, but I still don't want to be three-dimensional. That is totally literal. So more than two dimensions, but short of three. So for me, 2.7 is probably a very good place to be. <laughs> Um, I'm curious, I've never heard anyone ask, and maybe there's a good reason why they haven't, um, whether you're interested in conveying a sense of dynamism and motion and speed in the circuit works, um, has any connection whatsoever to the interests, even if in opposition, the Italian futurist desire to visualize the fourth dimension of time within a painting, as in Russolo's uh, uh, dynamism of an automobile that we're looking at here. <laughs> Look, it, it, it's really four dimensions is a problem in a three-dimensional world that we live in, and fractional ideas about dimensions is also a problem because it doesn't make any sense. And um, so if you're dealing with numbers and geometry and you have to, uh, if, if things have to, and if things have to relate to what can actually happen, it, 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 it's kind of difficult. I mean, you can have an uh, you know, you can make an um, uh, have an imaginary idea, and but it, it, in the end, it has to have some basis, some something that holds it. And it's not that the um, that the painting that wants to show you something about time, about four dimensions, uh, or the relationship of time to uh, making a, a four dimensional or dealing with four dimensional possibility of four-dimensional four space, a multi-dimensional space. Um, but they're not going um, it, to, it, it just becomes, to discuss it is, doesn't really get anywhere. It, it's better to do, to just go ahead and, and do it mm. and uh, give us the best that you can. It always and rather, does. You know, it's, talking about it doesn't, doesn't really make sense. Mm. You described your black paintings at one point as almost a sort of anti-Pollock in terms of how they dealt with surface and space or lack thereof and so forth. And I'm curious how the circuit works relate to the tension in Pollock between an overall skein of paint and then the emergence of form out of that web or that skein, um, as in the Pollock here, out of the web. Well, in this illustration, it looks okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm not sure that that's what Pollock had in mind. But yeah, um, mm -hmm. but yeah I mean, the, the thing in Pollock, I mean, why this, I suppose this painting is so great, the Pollock painting, is uh, it is, um, I assume that that's on uh, uh, something like Masonite or something, so he's able to cut into it and lift off part of the painting. And that, it's just a, a great idea uh, mm -hmm. to cut into what you've made and then take it away mm. and reveal something underneath. Yeah. I mean, it's a very nice reversal of positive and negative. Hmm. Uh, this, of course, is one of El Lizitsky's illustrations for the Hadgadya, which is a Haggadah text for Passover. It um, has a wonderful rhythmic uh, rhyming, children's sort of rhyme. Uh, in this case, uh, Hadgadya 5, which you see on the left, um, this is uh, the water that extinguished the fire, that burnt the stick, that beat the dog, that bit the cat, that ate the goat, which my father bought for two sizism. So that's, you know, has this wonderful uh, sort of uh, rhyming quality, but um, also uh, this wonderful evocation of water, this sort of moon-like face or head, bubble-like, I suppose, spouting forth water to extinguish the fire. Um, and you talked about the abstract elements of what seems to be a very illustrational, although semi-abstract, uh, El Lizitsky illustrations, um, and how you interpreted those into your own prints and the sort of personification of things that could then be transformed into abstraction. I wonder if you could talk about that. Hmm. I'm not quite sure that I can talk about it in that way, but I, mm -hmm. I can say that um, th there's a... a not a desire, but uh, uh, a sense that um, you can use abstraction in general, but basically abstract forms, mm. uh, and it's a it's a way that a way that they become uh, a substitute in some kind of way or a stand-in for figuration, and so that you can create 
a sense of narrative. So you can, in a sense, tell a story with a, a, a you can create a visual act, a sense of visual activity that can tell a, uh, it gives you the sense of telling a story. So it's pushing the idea that narration is not uh, out of bounds for abstraction. But, I mean, but <laughs> tells the story. <laughs> I know that the uh, Cones and Pillars series, we see an example here on the screen, Gaba Zopa e Color Torto, which is based on an Italo Calvino short story. Um, that it's partly based on a, a you said a stone cutting manual by Louis Monduit um, that shows how to cut these very elemental geometric forms. Um, mm -hmm. It also reminds me of drawing manuals a little bit, where you learn all the way back to the 18th, maybe even 17th century, how to shade volumetric shapes, be they cones or pillars or whatever they might be. Um, again, a very fundamental way of thinking about shape and volume and form, um, almost like art school in a sense. Um, but I'm also showing Fernand Leger, and I, he worked very uh, interestingly to subsume figuration within abstraction, um, creating this vocabulary of what are sometimes described as mechanomorphs that seem to embody the ideals of his industrial and urban age. And I'm wondering if you can discuss your own classical and neoclassical vocabulary of abstract form and its relation to figuration, if any. Well, I think I just said it, but anyway, um, <laughs> I, I think it. Um, I, I think that it's it, it's there. I mean, but it's not it's not what I particularly want to do because I, I want it's going to happen, or I take it as a kind of given, or it's inevitable in a way that you're going to see. It's the old story of you're going to see something in it, uh, in the way you see something in almost everything. Uh, so you, you organize it the way you want to organize it. But I think that um, in, in these uh, pieces, um, they, again, I think it, it turns out to be that you want to have the forms uh, both be themselves and be convincing as, as themselves, as forms, and yet be able to be convincing in the whole pictorial activity that's taking place. So, uh, and I think that's what's so great about the Leger. Hmm. And you obviously went at uh, el very eloquent length in your working space lectures at Harvard talking about Caravaggio. Um, I know many people in the audience have read these lectures, which are really quite fabulous. Um, talking about uh, the death of Titian and a crisis in Renaissance painting at the juncture with the Baroque. Um, and you look to Caravaggio as an exemplar whose ideas and innovations about space, painting, realism, abstraction had perhaps been somewhat overlooked. And I wonder if just uh, you'll indulge us for our audience, uh, talk a little bit about why you felt that he had been overlooked to some degree. Um, although I know in many art schools, uh, he was sort of a, a, a favorite child, a you know, godlike figure uh, held up to great you know, approbation. Um, but artists and painters didn't seem to really look at his work anymore uh, when you really started looking at him. Well, I think that uh, Caravaggio was, uh, I won't get my art history exactly right, but it wasn't until about after the war, the 1950s, that there was uh, uh, an interest in Italy in, in Caravaggio, and the, and the paintings began to be seen and he was talked about. At the end of the, I think it was at the end of the 17th century, he was number 71 in the world, <laughs> and, when, and Guido Reni, the divine Guido, was number one. So that gives you a, a pretty good idea. And by the way, I mean, I'm not knocking Guido in any way whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, I know. Um, but, you know, that's, and, and it's a pretty big swing about hmm. when you think about how people think about things hmm. and how we have our own ideas and, uh, of the consensus or how we uh, hmm. imagine what's great or what's important and all of those things. So it's pretty fluid. Hmm. Um, but the thing, but again, Caravaggio uh, was not something, in fact, I backed into Caravaggio. I learned, I didn't know if I learned to like it. I finally got it. But I was found uh, Caravaggio was often held up uh, because I hung around with maybe too many art historians or something. But they were always talking about Caravaggio. And, uh, and the thing about Caravaggio was that, um, you know, 
I knew why people, why it was so popular. People liked it because it looked real, um, and you know, and it's a kind of compelling realism. I, I admit, but I never, it suddenly, uh, I I found that I could live with it when I saw a painting in the um, in the Capitoline Museum, mm -hmm. and I just saw it at the end of it. I, I think it was a. Um, a John the a Baptist with a, a ram or something. Um, and it looked, I said, OK, it looks real. I get it. And, uh, but then all of a sudden, I said, but why am I so worried about it looks real? I'm threatened by it, it looks real because I make abstract painting. I mean, I was 35 or 40 years old. Why should I worry about how somebody else painted and that kind of painting is better or more interesting than the kind of painting I might be doing? Mm. I mean, well, that, that doesn't make much sense, and it's not mm. really very interesting. Mm. But it was all of a sudden to me, and this, again, was probably not that much more interesting, if any at all, is that it was real to me in the sense that what I could see Caravaggio spent his time organizing, making, painting was real to him. That's the way he wanted to make. Pictorial expression was important to him. And he was making picture, making a painting all the time. And that's what he was doing. He was, uh, and that was what was real about the experience, mm -hmm. was that that much effort went into making a painting. Um, I had the same experience that you had with your children in growing up in New York of going to the Coney Island Aquarium and seeing the beautiful white beluga whale there, uh, which we thought was magical, along with the electric eel that had the voltameter on the case and uh, would show you how much voltage it was putting off. Um, and very interestingly and astonishingly, uh, you set yourself the task, I believe, sort of on a dare and away from your kids to make a work of art for every one of the 130 two chapters plus three more chapters, essentially, 135 works. And what I really wanted to ask you is you, you've talked about how Melville's Moby Dick is so astonishingly complex uh, a work of art. It was really the only term for it. Um, it does have, by the way, I, don't quote me, but I believe it's somewhere around chapters 52 to 55 very famously are, have titles like of whales in paint, of whales in iron, of whales in so forth, you know, ivory bones, scrimshaw, and so forth. Um, so there are visual artistic discussions in Moby Dick, which is a, a footnote. But what's more interesting, I think, is the way in which this great epic, um, this voyage of discovery or lack of uh, inner or outer discovery, I guess I should say, um, across the face of the earth, um, really has all these convoluted byways, these digressions. Uh, traditional narrative seems to be thrown out the window, and yet you feel this inexorable path and force forward, uh, the sense of motion, I guess. And it seems like, in a way, your series of 135 works is... Um, very, in a way, captures better than maybe volumes of literary criticism that forensically dissect Moby Dick, which God knows we've all read and suffered through in school, um, is really more of an apt, uh, both an homage and a critique of what Melville's trying to accomplish. Uh, I'm not sure where I'm supposed to go here. Uh, <laughs> Anywhere you want. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it, it was a kind of challenge, and, and once... Uh, but I, I think that it was, uh, again, I hate to beat geometry to death, but there was something that happened uh, with the whale and with the idea of using the whale and using the water. And, uh, and the idea is the, uh, of the shapes. I mean, you, you can have, uh, there were curved lines uh, in uh, the protractors, and there were straight lines in the, uh, in the other geometric figures and everything. But there's something about uh, making shapes that are essentially can be waved or curved. And so it's for a more complicated uh, geometry uh, of curved surfaces. And uh, you know it, it, it's going to drift off into differential geometry and eventually topology. But it was, uh, but I, we took it in a, uh, in a really straightforward way, which was to make shapes and then bend them. Uh, so we curve them. It's not just the lines that are curved, but the surfaces themselves are curved. And once the, you have curved surfaces, uh, you can tell what's going to happen. You're going to have curved surfaces, and then you're going to have to give them volume. But that's going to come. Uh, but it, and it did begin to appear in the uh, in, in the Moby Dick in, in the series, which it had had enough room to accommodate. Uh, 
new or different ideas. I mean, actually, I guess for me, it worked really well in the sense that it gave you uh, a, a way of saying uh, a kind of freedom from yourself and from the idea of style, because it's not just that you could do anything, but you could follow any lead. And so any degree uh, of development that you were capable of was allowable and, uh, and also almost mandated. Mm -hmm. So you would follow the things through. I'm showing uh, Hans Hoffman's The Lark, um, which may or may not have anything directly to do with it. The reason I'm showing it, um, in addition to the fact that I know you admire Hoffman and um, I think hold him in high regard, which um, not, you know, he, he probably is not held in as high regard as he should be. Let's put it that way. I think he's an I amazing, all extraordinary agree, artist. Um, and I believe you own one or two of his paintings as well. <laughs> um, the, one of the interesting things about Hoffman, uh, his extraordinary accomplishments, painting both somewhat representationally and then certainly abstractly, even abstractly as the title of the Lark suggests, when he's, he's thinking of uh, presumably this little bird-like form that's up there in silhouette, the black shape. Um, these are almost certainly happenstances, although his titles often seem to suggest it could be a garden or an interior or some kind of natural life like a bird. Um, whether they come first or second is really almost irrelevant to the point. Um, and I know you've spoken about things that might or might not appear in your own work. Richard Diemenkorn, very famously here in the Bay Area, said he'd be painting abstractly and working completely abstractly, and a Mickey Mouse would pop up. And he'd say, back it would go to the studio to delete the, the Mickey Mouse. Um, and uh, you had a wonderful quote. You said, um, I do not have a secret desire to put Donald Duck or naked women in my paintings, although, they, although I know they harbor a secret desire to be there. Um, <laughs> um, but you also said, I feel involved with certain shapes, like the whale. They mean something special to me. I love the shapes. And for me, they have an intrinsic identity and value. I love them in themselves and don't see them just as forms to be manipulated. They're very personal. I like them the way someone might like his girlfriend's ankle. Um, and so I wonder how that informs the... Uh, I don't know if there are any ankles in there, but... Uh, no, <laughs> there's certainly I whales. I see now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, good. Oh, do you want to? Uh, no, no, keep going. Okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to answer that. Um, so I'm showing, of course, the incredible painting in our lobby, Earthquake in Chile, um, which is inspired by German writer, romantic writer, Heinrich von Cleese, romantic 1807 novel, uh, Earthquake in Chile, which is based on an historical incident in which I didn't know about. The city of Ch uh, Santiago, Chile, was uh, completely leveled in 1647, and von Cleese intertwines this wonderful, tragic, romantic love story uh, amidst the ruins, truly, of the city. Um, and you said of his work, he has an immediacy, a relentlessness that I like. He never stops. You can see the chaos and drama in the forms of my works. Um, and this it's a painting, truly, although you can describe better than I can the technique. It seems to take uh, the power and physical presence of a lot of your constructions and compress them back into painting, almost as if you had evolved outwards in the, in the Polish villages, exotic birds, circuits, and Moby Dick, and so forth, pillars, cones and pillars, and then now it has the power and presence and force of this compacted, constricted, confined, um, and yet still explosive imagery. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about von Kleist um, and this painting. Mm -hmm. um. It's hard, I mean, it, it, it's the same, I don't know how different it is from uh, dealing with uh, the Moby Dick pieces, uh, but, uh, but that was, um, I don't know, I, I grew up a little bit on the water in Ipswich, Massachusetts, so something about Melville and something about the, the, the ships and the sea was just, didn't seem normal to me. There wasn't there wasn't anything special, so you could you you could deal with. It. I mean, but Kleist is truly exotic, and um, and there, there there was a tremendous appeal to that because the exoticism sort of had a, a almost no end to it. I mean, you could, uh, but it, it was not only that it could be expansive, but what was it could be also so convoluted that it was almost to the point of being nonsensical. Mm. Uh, you know, who needs that much of all of those kind of things that many times on top of each other? Mm. And, uh, but then, if they don't 
interact, and if they don't, and if they don't uh, run into each other, um, then you know it, it's not you. You you get something you don't you don't really get the feeling you don't you can't tell the story the narrative doesn't roll it doesn't mm -hmm. have a drive to it so it's a kind of uh, the tightness and the wound up quality is somehow uh, I guess mm -hmm. like somewhat like a spring and it it unwinds and then it goes mm -hmm. and is part of that uh, tension and that dynamism uh, akin to the urban environment. Um, you've spent most of your life living in Manhattan. You've seen it both demolished and constructed. And uh, I know at one point you were in your studio and you told someone there was destruction uh, building outside, and you said, we've already got that covered. <laughs> Does that influence this kind of work or um, that kind of energy? I don't know. Uh, things like the, uh, the, the stories, uh, you know, romantic stories, uh, that are based in as as it is in uh, in an event. Hmm. Uh, the the feeling that you can get the dynamism of the event uh, and have some involvement in it seems like you know uh, something that you know it's hard to avoid the the attraction. Hmm. This is the last work I'm going to show from very recent series, the Scarlatti Kirkpatrick series, which. Um, as you all know, having seen the exhibition, uh, Domenico Scarlatti, the Italian composer, uh, and in this case, most relevantly, harps harpsichord composer and, and, and player, um, and then Ralph Kirkpatrick, who cataloged Scarlatti's sonatas. So they all have his catalog numbers. Um, and I'm showing it here with, uh, of course, Kandinsky um, at the lower left. This is a work in New York in a museum. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask you about Kandinsky. He was one of the first artists whose work you really knew, uh, were inspired by, um, and the ways in which um, his in, in sort of experimentation in painting and now yours in more fully volumetric form uh, might share some kind of kinship or similar interests and, and also how they differ. Uh, all I can see is the Bramini. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, red, uh, it's red oval. <laughs> yeah. um, no, uh, I, I like, I mean, you, you can't help but Love Kandinsky and the and the abstraction. The part of Kandinsky that I was taken with was somewhat similar to the thing that uh, happened or uh, with Caravaggio, which was that what was a problem for me, which you know I couldn't understand, uh, which were the uh, late paintings, uh, which were kind of biomorphic, or they would the shapes and forms were called biomorphic, and uh, those paintings. Uh, were said to be a perfect example of an artist in decline. Mm. Uh, they were his la uh, late paintings, and he moved. Uh, and uh, it, you know, for the same reason that uh, uh, Caravaggio was so re real and so uh, a, so much a part of the discussion of what was the way art history should go. Uh, this Kandinsky was a, a perfect example of the way art history had made up its mind about uh, about Kandinsky and how he was seen as you know going off the edge, mm -hmm. and uh, that I, I don't know how that uh, uh, affected me, but um, the kind of forms it it, it it led to what I guess what I mentioned before was when you uh, move from. Uh, um, uh, when you have a, a, a uh, three-dimensional geometry, a kind of solid geometry that's uh, fairly rigid and geometric, and when it softens and bends and curves, uh, you, it becomes uh, more organic, more biomorphic, mm -hmm. whatever you want to say. And I mean, I think that that's a pretty good, uh, that's not exactly the latest Kandinsky, I guess. But anyway, you can mm -hmm. see how that they're, uh, they go, they're not so far apart. Mm -hmm. And um, for the Bernini, which <laughs> you immediately noticed, is there, um, in addition to the music and the source of Scarlatti being Baroque, mm -hmm. is there a Baroque sensibility at work in these sculptures? They're still uh, attached to the wall and or the floor in this case, as you all know, who've been through the exhibition. So they 
um, are hanging somewhat tenuously to the realm of painting, and yet they are astonishing paintings, um, while also being fully volumetric and experienced in, in dimensions as you walk around them, which of course you're supposed to do. Um, and I'm curious if there's any connection for you. Bernini, very famously, was not only a great sculptor, but also, of course, a great architect. Uh, like so many Renaissance Baroque masters, he could do pretty much anything and did. Um, and especially the St. Teresa, which although it's sort of the most famous and maybe therefore arguably a cliche, is built into an architectonic setting and is bound to the wall in some way, while at the same time yeah, being I'm one of the most... I'm all for it. You don't have to yep. convince me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so tell me what you think about Bernini. Mm. No, I mean, it, you know, it, it, it's one of those things. I mean, it, it, what, what interests me in a way about the art of the past is, uh, I think I mentioned it earlier, I'll just go say it one more time, but uh, when I was a student, um, I went to Philadelphia and uh, uh, I looked at, I saw at the top of the stairway at the, uh, the museum, uh, the Philadelphia Museum, the uh, Van der Weyden mm -hmm. crucifixion. And so that was, um, I could understand it in the sense that I knew that it, 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 it was, you know, a very, a very powerful kind of experience and everything. But it, I, I felt that I could never do that and I wouldn't do that. But it represented a kind of goal, uh, a kind of sense of, uh, you know, I said, well, you know, we talk about a lot of kind of art. It's great. It's this and that. But this was exalted art. Mm. And you know, it wasn't you didn't have to think that much about it. And but on the other hand, I did feel that I could understand it in a way that wasn't really relevant to understanding it, which was to say the obvious. Well, I can see that in abstract or formal terms, but it looked to me, you know, it's Roger Van der Weyden, but I didn't. I could see Mondrian right there against the mm -hmm. gray wall and the blank. So that it, again, kind of obvious, but. A very, very, uh, really compelling in a way. Mm. And uh, that's the way it, it happens later on. Uh, and I can say the same thing about uh, thinking a slightly different way uh, about the Bernini. Mm. So it's there and it's at a, a very high level. And what's great about it is that it, it's something it seems so worthwhile uh, to try to get to that level mm. or to do something close to that. I'm going to end here and <laughs> take some questions for Mr. Stella um, with what I hope is one of your quotes. Um, <laughs> what abstract painting can do better than anything else is evoke that sense of recognition that's indefinite yet ecstatic at the same time. It's getting to the emotional underpinnings that we all share that is the substitute for the common religious or social belief. I believe that abstraction can do that. And I'm showing this uh, wonderful photograph from Hollis Frampton's series of The Secret Life of Frank Stella Secret World of Frank Stella, based on the secret life of Picasso, probably. Um, and the reason I showed it is because it's well known, almost to the, the you know, repetition, that in a sense uh, you seem to appear to topple the columns of the art world. But I think what's often overlooked in this wonderful uh, uh, appropriation and quotation of Leonardo's Vitruvian Man, complete with a protractor painting uh, before the letter at the mm -hmm. top there, um, that you also have done so much to support the history of abstraction, embrace it, um, and while being an iconoclast at the same time, perhaps also extending the tradition in a really meaningful and valuable way. So much modern contemporary art seems to sunder itself uh, from its uh, you know, older art historical precedents or investigations, and I think it's astonishing that you've managed consistently to be knowledgeable and articulate about the history of art, but in a way that's actually meaningful rather than simply talking about it, actually moving it forward in a really extraordinary way. So we, we want to thank you, and I want to thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.